Yeah. Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puffed wheat yeah. and Quaker puffed rice, yeah. the breakfast cereal shot from guns, yeah. Yeah. present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. And King, on you huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush, with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Here's an up and atom breakfast, the cereal shot from guns, the one and only Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Just pour out a bowl full, crisp and fresh, right from the big red and blue package. Add milk or cream, top with your favorite fruit, grab your spoon, and up and at them. Mmm, delicious. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, sure, for a breakfast treat, eat tasty Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Night was closing in fast, and a sudden cold snap had dropped the temperature to far below zero as two men stopped for the night at a roadhouse on the Yukon Trail. Oh, there, my good fellow. Are you the keeper of this tavern? Yeah, I run the joint. What can I do for you? Can you put us up for the night? I guess so. If you don't mind sharing a room with another gent. Oh, uh, I trust our wallets will be quite safe. Sure they will. This guy's a real gent. Matter of fact, he wasn't feeling so well, so he wanted to get right to bed. You probably won't hear a peep out of him. That suits us fine. Where's the room? It's upstairs. I'll show you the way. Come on. The roadhouse keeper led the way upstairs and down a dark, chilly passageway to a room at the end of the hall. Yeah, I guess he went to sleep and left the lamp burning. Hmm. What's this here? Box of beers? Probably his medicine. He told me he had a bad heart. Touch of angina, no doubt. Well, they are, gents. We'll be saving dinner in just a few minutes. Oh, oh. Late that night, the two partners were awakened by several agonized groans, hey, hey, followed by it. the sound of a falling body. Charlie lighted the lamp. Uh, Charlie, what's wrong? Holy smoke. The guy's dead. Yeah. Oh, he must have had another heart attack. He... Looks like he tried to get out of bed and reach his pills, but he didn't quite make it. Well, I guess I better go rouse the owner. No, no, no. Wait a minute. What's the matter? Uh, before you notify the owner, maybe we'd better uh, investigate a bit. Hmm? Uh, what are you going to do? Oh, I just thought I might go through his pockets. Looking for his bankroll, I suppose? Well, if we don't take it, the roadhouse owner will. Hmm. Here's an identification card. Does it uh, tell who he is? Oh, yes. Professor... Franklin Irving, Department of Languages, Eastern State University. Oh, hey, professor, huh? Uh, he's got a letter in his pocket, too. Oh, what does it say? Let's see. My dear Professor Irving, the enclosed message was written by your brother Philip just before he died. Due to an oversight, it was omitted from my previous letter. Trust that I shall see you in Dawson sometime before the end of January regarding the settlement of, of your brother's estate. Yours very truly, Henry Martin 
Consulate law. What does he mean by that enclosed message business? Uh, there's something else inside the envelope. Uh, here it is. It says, Dear brother, my beloved wife passed away yesterday and I myself am sinking fast. I am entrusting a treasure to you and hope that the letter ends right there. Well, he must have died before he finished it. Yes, probably so. Oh, uh, Charlie, did you notice that last sentence? What do you mean? Well, it says, I am entrusting our treasure to you. Oh, what about it? Well, apparently Professor Irving was going to Dawson to take over his brother's estate. Sure, that's obvious from the lawyer's letter. Yes. Uh, suppose I were to go to this lawyer fellow and present myself as Professor Franklin Irving. You know, Senator, I think you've got something there. The following day, at Mounted Police Headquarters in Dawson City, Inspector Maynard spoke to Sergeant Preston. Well, Sergeant, a rather odd coincidence has happened. Yes, sir. When the saltwater mail came in yesterday, I received a letter from the New York police. The letter informed me that two notorious confidence men were on their way to the Yukon. Who are they, sir? One of them is named Philo Blackburn. Senator Blackburn, he calls himself. The other is known as Hard Time Charlie Bemis. Here are circulars on them that the New York police sent me. Believe it or not, Sergeant, they started out as vaudeville acrobats. Oh. Oh, won't be hard to remember these faces. You won't have to remember Blackburn's face. Oh, how so? Because I just got word that he died last night at a roadhouse called the Sourdough's Rest. I'll have to send someone to take charge of Blackburn's body to see to his personal effects. I thought I might give you the job, Sergeant, and while you're at it, you could try to get a line on his partner. Very well, sir. Oh, uh, maybe I'd better take these circulars along with me. It's a good idea, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. Come along, King. <laughs> Later that same day, the sergeant and King arrived at the sourdough's rest. The roadhouse owner led them to an upstairs room. Their body's right in there, sergeant. Hmm, it's funny. Looks different from this picture. Maybe we'd better check and make sure this is Philo Blackman. According to this police circular, Blackman has a knife scar on his right forearm. Well, let's see. This man has no scar. Then this isn't Philo Blackburn? Apparently not. But if he isn't Blackburn, then, then how did Blackburn's papers get into his pocket? I don't know. Maybe you'd better take a look at this picture. Ever seen that man? Let's see. Why, well, sure I have. Huh? This guy stayed here last night. He had a partner with him. In fact, they shared a room with the man who died. I took their names before they shoved off this morning. What names did they give you? Well, this guy here in the picture claims he was a professor. Professor Franklin Irvin. What about his partner? Uh, his partner gave the name of Charles Bemis. I have another circular here. Take a look at it. Is this the man who said his name was Bemis? Yeah, 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 that's him. Bemis and Blackburn are partners. They've been operating together for years. Then the guy who told me he was Professor Irvin is really Philo Blackburn. Certainly looks that way. But uh, what about the dead man here? Who's he? I'm beginning to think he must be the real Professor Irving. Well, I'll be doggone. Uh, what are you going to do, Sergeant? First, I'll take the professor's body to Dawson, and then I'll locate Blackburn and Bemis. Meanwhile, Philo Blackburn, posing as Professor Irving, had arrived in Dawson with his partner, Charlie Bemis. They registered at the Victoria Hotel, where the fake professor was interviewed by an enterprising reporter on the Dawson City Gazette. The next morning, the two confidence men went to call on lawyer Henry Morton. Uh, before we get down to business, Professor, I extend my deepest sympathy to you over the death of your brother and his wife. Thank you. It was a tragic business, extremely tragic. I'm afraid there may be some red tape connected with settling your brother's affairs, seeing that he was an American citizen. Oh. Well, that's not so good. Yes, it does seem like a waste of time. Especially since he left almost no worldly possessions. What? Hey, uh, I, I beg your pardon. I say it does seem like a waste of time, especially since he left almost no worldly possessions. As you know, his claim never paid off. What did you? What about the treasure he's in trusting to be? The treasure he speaks about in that last letter he wrote. Oh, that. 
Well, I thought you understood. Understood what? That your brother was speaking about his baby daughter. Oh. Baby daughter. Why, certainly. Your brother and his wife always referred to little Lucy as their treasure. Uh, she... I've already arranged to have the nurse bring the baby over to your hotel this afternoon. Why, Professor, what's the matter? You're looking quite ill. I am feeling rather ill. A touch of angina, no doubt. While the fake professor and his partner were speaking to Lawyer Morton, three outlaws sat in an isolated miner's cabin several miles from Dawson. How about a hand of poker, Race? No, I'm fed up with playing cards. Someone coming. They go see. Must be Lefty getting back from town. Ah, yeah, you're right. Lefty coming back. Hey, listen, Ace. Who do you suppose just flew into Dawson? How should I know? Philip Irving's brother. What's that? Wait till you hear the rest. I heard a reporter interviewing him in a hotel lobby. It turns out he's a professor of languages at some university. Professor of language? Yeah. You realize what that means? You're doggone right I do. It means he can translate that secret message that young Irving wrote. What do you think we better do, Ace? I'll tell you what we'll do. Lefty, you and me will go to Dawson and grab this professor guy. We'll bring him back here to the cab. Moose, you and Breed will stay here and guard our gold. Is that clear? Right. Okay. All right, Lefty. Let's get going. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Supposing we were to go into the old-time general store in Dawson City, the store where gold prospectors get their supplies. I'll bet the sleepy old-timer who runs this store would really perk up his ears if we told him about Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice being shot from guns. Hey, who what? What varmint shooting up my store? <laughs> now, the only thing I know of that's being shot are the cereals shot from guns. Cereals? Yep, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. The swellest tasting ready-to-serve breakfast cereals from here to Whitehorse. But uh, them guns? Why, they're the guns that are loaded with choice, sun-ripened premium grains of rice or wheat. Then these guns are exploded. <laughs> Out come big, giant grains eight times normal size. They're magnified, crispified. Shot through and through with bang-up nut-like flavor, too. That's why Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat are so good to eat. Say, I reckon I'd have me a gold mine right in this store if I could sell rice or wheat shot from guns. You sure would. Folks like it for breakfast, lunch, or supper. All you do is pour out a bowl full right from the package. No cooking. Just add milk or cream and top with your favorite fruit. Mighty inviting, I calls it. Mighty nourishing, too. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice furnish added health values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Well, uh, how can I get me a sack of them? Oh, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are never sold in bags or bulk. And that's something for you fellas and girls to remember, too. Tell your mom to please look for the red and blue packages with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Then she'll be sure to get the original crisp, fresh Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Now to continue our story. Senator Blackburn and Hard Time Charlie were seated in their hotel room. The senator was rocking a baby in his arms. Oh, Charlie, hand me that bottle again. Oh, here. Thank you. Oh, here you are, precious. Yeah. Oh, there's really nothing to child care when you go about it scientifically. All right, mastermind. Now tell us how we're going to get out of this mess you've got us into. <coughs> We are in a bit of a fix at that, aren't a we? A bit of a fix. You and your big ideas. Oh, yes. You know, there are times when I almost wish we'd stuck to Bodville. You remember our old tumbling act, Charlie? I remember. And remember that lovely young partner of ours, Lenora, and the way we used to toss her around? Are you? Oh. Mm. Last time I saw her, she weighed 200 pounds. <laughs> I wonder who that is. Are 
Are you Professor Irvin? No, I'm his secretary. The professor's inside. Now step aside, mister. Come hey, on, what Lefty. are you doing? What's the meaning of this outrageous intrusion? Get your park on, Professor. Be mighty quick about oh, it. Oh, good heavens, he's got a gun. You're doggone right I got a gun. Hey, you there, mister. Better get your park on, too. You're coming along with us. Anything you say. Oh, but uh, what about the baby? If I put her down, she'll start hauling again. In that case, you'd better bundle her up and bring her along. <laughs> We're all going bye-bye. Meanwhile, back at the crook's hideout, the outlaw called Moose was talking to his pal, Breed. You know, Breed, I've been thinking. There must be quite a bit of gold over at Father LeClaire's mission. A lot of the miners take their gold dust there for safekeeping. Maybe so. But Ace tell us not to rob mission. Make too much trouble. Uh, that's what I'm getting at. Ace ain't here to stop us. What you mean? You and me can go over and rob the mission by ourselves. And if we're lucky, we can pull the job before Ace and Lefty get back from Dawson. Ah, smart idea. But what about gold here in cabin? Ace, tell us to stay here and guard it. Uh, we'll hide it in a good, safe place while we're gone. Oh, where we hide it? Now listen, there's an old tin box on the rubbish dump out back. We'll put the gold in that and set the box up on one of the roof beams. Come on. Let's get busy. Yeah. When Sergeant Preston returned to Dawson, he began making inquiries at all the hotels. Finally, he found that the fake professor and his partner had registered at the Hotel Victoria. After quizzing the desk clerk, Sergeant Preston went to Lawyer Morton's office. Well, hello there, Sergeant. Hello, Henry. Here, King, old fellow. How are you? Henry, I understand you have a client by the name of Irving, Professor Franklin Irving. That's right. He came to Dawson to wind up his brother's affairs. I just turned a baby over to him this morning. I heard about that. Yeah, the professor was quite disappointed. He was expecting to receive some kind of a treasure. Oh? How so? Well, when Philip Irving was dying, he wrote to his brother saying he was entrusting his treasure to the professor's care. Phil was referring to his baby daughter, but the professor didn't know that. You know, Henry, that explains a great deal. Well, what do you mean, Sergeant? To begin with, Professor Irving is really a confidence man known as Senator Blackburn. And the man with him... The sergeant explained to Lawyer Morton how Senator Blackburn had exchanged identities with the professor. Well, I'll be doggone. Where are those two, Sergeant? Did you arrest them? I haven't found them yet. The desk clerk told me they left the hotel with two men about an hour ago. I was hoping you knew something about that. I don't know anything about it, Sergeant. Who were the two men? The description of one of them sounded a little like Ace Ranshaw. Ace Ranshaw? Who's he? Leader of a gang that's been terrorizing the miners north of here for the last month or so. Say, what about the baby? The desk clerk says the senator was carrying the baby with him when he left. Good heavens, the child might be in danger. You've got to find them, Sergeant. We'll find them all right, don't worry. I'll take King back to the hotel right away. Well, why go back to the hotel? Can't you start it after them immediately? It's King who's going to do the tracking, Henry. The hotel is where he'll pick up the trail. Besides, I'll need some items of clothing to give him the scent. Come on, boy. It was dusk, and a heavy snow was falling when Ace and Lefty arrived back at the hideout Come with their on, two, two prisoners. All right, it's all right. Don't push, don't push. What the... The place is empty. What about the gold? I'll go see. The gold's gone. Gone. By those dirty double-crossing rats. What are we going to do, Ace? Now, don't worry. We'll find those sneaking polecats and give them what's coming to them. Well, what about us? I've got a little job for you, Professor. A job? What kind of a job? Eh? Well, I like the lamp here. Uh, I've got a message here written in some kind of foreign lingo. Since you're a professor of languages, you're going to translate it for me. But, uh, and you better translate it right or it'll be just too bad. Meanwhile, King had followed the trail of the two missing confidence men for several miles beyond the outskirts of Dawson. But the heavy snowfall gradually dispersed the scent. Sergeant Preston decided to make a brief detour to the nearby mission. See, King! See, fella! That's it! We'll find out if Father LeClaire can give us any information. All right, on, King! On. A short time later, Sergeant Preston approached the mission. He didn't know that Moose and Breed were holding a gun on Father LeClaire and that the two crooks had seen his approach. Mountie, stopping straight outside. All right, Father. Here's what we're going to do. Breed will be standing right behind you when you open the door. 
I'll be standing on the other side of the doorway with my gun pointed right at you. So don't go trying to warn the Mounty. My son, I beseech you to reconsider. You're about to commit a most grievous sin. Never mind the advice. I'll just do like I tell you. Or you'll get the same as the Redcoat's gonna get. Unaware of the danger he was facing, Sergeant Preston walked up to the door of the mission. But King bristled and sniffed the air suspiciously. His nostrils told him that someone was standing in wait just inside the door. What's wrong, fella? The sergeant drew his revolver and then knocked. Sergeant, don't enter! Why, you... Oh, my arm! Before Breed could maneuver for a shot, King's jaws closed on his gun hands. Then for your father, I'll handle this. Don't try anything, Moose. Can I with my arm busted? Don't kill me! Put him off, quick! All right, King. On guard, fella. He's had enough. Get your hands up, Breed, and keep them up. You and Moose are both under arrest in the name of the Queen. A few minutes later, the sergeant listened as the two outlaws confessed their crime. Moose, I know that you and Breed are both members of Ace Ranshaw's gang. Where's your hideout? We've been hiding out in a cabin about three miles north of here. A guy named Philip Irving used to live there. Near the mouth of Shotgun Creek? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Sergeant Preston... Already you have faced death once today. If you go after those outlaws, they may kill you. We'll see about that, Father. Meanwhile, Senator Blackburn was sweating profusely as he faced the muzzle of a cock six shooter held by Ace Ranch. I'm getting fed up with all this stalling around, Professor. Are you going to read me that message or not? Oh, yes, yes, of course. <clears throat> Let me see. Oh, written in ancient Babylonian. I recognize that at a glance. That's a... Uh... Very difficult tongue, Babylonian. Are you going to read that message, or am I going to pull this trigger? No, no, don't do that. I'll translate it. Well, here goes. Once upon a time, a long time ago... Don't give me that once upon a time stuff. I know what the message is about. Oh, you do, huh? What is it about? Tells where some gold is hidden somewhere around this cabin. Oh, dear me. How did you figure that out? (laughs) It was easy. For one thing, we got the message off your brother. And he said it was meant for you. Why should he write his own brother a letter in some foreign lingo? For another thing, there was no gold in the cabin, even though he was working a claim. So you put two and two together and figured out that the message told where the gold was hidden. That's right. As he stalled for time, Senator Blackburn had been glancing desperately around the cabin. His attention was caught by a ray of lamplight glinting on something metallic up on one of the roof beams. He decided to take a chance. Well, I, I guess there's no use holding out on you any longer. I'll translate the message. Oh, uh, most of it's personal stuff. Uh, shall I skip that? Yeah, skip all that and get to the point. Yes, very well. It uh, says here, I have hidden the gold upon one of the roof beams in the southwest corner of the cabin. A roof uh, beam. Hey, he's right, Ace. There's a tin box up there. Now get it down. Let's have a look at it. Uh, Funny, we never noticed that before. Lefty placed a chair under the roof beam. Then he climbed up and lifted down the box. Plenty heavy. Bring it over here to the table. Uh, yeah. uh, now, let me get this cover off. Uh, holy uh, smoke, it's full of gold. Man alive, just feast your eyes on that. Why, there's as much here as Moose and Breed got away with. Now I've seen everything. Hey, somebody's coming. Some sourdough, probably. I'll get rid of him. As for you two, there better not be any squawks out of either of you, or it's the last squawk you'll ever make. <laughs> We're not looking for trouble. Oh, dear me, she's awake again. I'd better rock her some Before opening the door, Ace holstered his gun, but kept his hand in position for a quick draw. Put up your hands, Rancho. Uh, uh, Mounty. Start backing up. Watch him, King. As he realized what was happening, Lefty threw his gun and ducked behind the senator. Don't come any closer, Monty. If you're smart, you'll give up peaceably. Don't make me laugh. You wouldn't dare try shooting at me with this baby right in your line of fire. Now drop your gun before I let you have it. Well, I think he's making a big mistake, don't you, Charlie? How would I know? Well, simply because when I say, Ali up, you'll say, Hup, now. With the skilled timing of professional acrobats, the senator tossed the baby through the air to Charlie and then dropped to the floor, leaving Lefty exposed to Sergeant Preston's gunfire. The sergeant fired first, blasting the gun out of Lefty's hand. Ace tried to catch the sergeant off guard, but King sprang at him savagely. Call off your door. Get him away from me. All right, King. Let him up, boy. On your feet, Ranshaw. You and Lefty are under arrest in the name of the Queen. 
Senator Blackburn explained to the sergeant why the outlaws had brought him to the cabin. They brought me here to translate a message from my brother. The message told where this box of gold was hidden. It's uh, written in Babylonian. Oh, let's see. This isn't Babylonian, it's Latin. Latin? Oh, dear me, of course. Slight mistake. Mm. Uh, Nevertheless, I was able to translate it correctly. Father Leclerc will be able to tell us what it really says, Uh, and in the meantime, you can drop the professor act. uh, I happen to know you're Senator Blackburn, and this is your partner, Hard Time uh, Charlie uh, Venus. But the big surprise came later at the mission when Ace Ranshaw came face to face with Moose and Breed. Why, you double-crossing skunks! Honest, Ace, we were going to split with you after we robbed the mission. Split with me? What about that gold you swiped from the cabin? We didn't swipe any gold. Oh, no. I suppose it just vanished in the thin Mm. air. No, we put it in a tin box and then stuck it up on the roof beam. What? What? (sighs) Well, uh, Paul, the... Then that was our old gold we found. What I'd like to know is how that fake professor knew where it was hidden. I'd like to know that myself. Well, if you must know, it was just a lucky guess. I happened to spot that box up there on the roof beams and decided to take a chance. Will you translate the message, please, Father? Oui, I will read it. But it's not about hidden treasure. Apparently, Philip Irving just decided to write a letter to his brother in Latin to keep his mind occupied. As a matter of fact, the letter tells how his claim has proved worth it. What's that? Well, Ace, now you know two things that don't pay. One is Phil Irving's claim, and the other is crime. It looks like this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Wednesday's adventure. Listen, all you fellows and girls, if you'd like to have the tireless energy, the vigor and stamina of a person like Sergeant Preston, do this. Make the breakfast table your training table. Start every day with a nourishing He-Man's breakfast, including a heaping bowlful of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice, topped with fruit and milk or cream. Delicious, nutritious wheat or rice shot from guns is never sold in bags or bulk. Always buy the big red and blue Quaker package to get the original crisp, fresh Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Listen Wednesday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case Note of evidence. When a young widow came to headquarters concerning her claim to the estate of a wealthy mine owner, we thought she had no chance due to the peculiarity of the will. But I became suspicious at the hearing, and with King's help set out to find the one person who could decide the case. When King finally led me to that person, we came face to face with a desperate killer. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Wednesday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from guns. Your best bet for hot breakfast is Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Yes, if you want to be a star in sports and school activities, make your hot cereal Quaker Oats. Because Quaker Oats helps grow the stars of the future. You get more growth. More endurance from oatmeal than from any other whole grain cereal. Remember, Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice.